By the way, we have a really good AV team, audio-visual team. I don't know what was causing the problems with a projector, but praise the Lord, it's working. It would be horrible if we had to actually like look at paper and, and go back to... <laughs> I was like, oh no, what are we going to do? I have all these slides. I guess we could use printed Bibles. <laughs> Nothing can replace. By the way, this book has never crashed or glitched or suffered because of limited connectivity. I understand at home, I'm sorry folks, you're having difficulty with skipping and pausing of the live stream this morning. I apologize. Um, We're happy that you're joining us or trying to join us uh, today. But this book, if you have a printed copy, it doesn't crash. Amen? Well, before we... uh, get into God's word this morning, let's just, as far as possible, kneel before our God. And by the way, our, our prayer signal never gets interrupted either. So let us talk to our God at this time. Loving Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be here today. Uh, and it's amazing to think about um, all the other people worshiping around the world on this special Sabbath day. We live in different time zones, we live in different places, but Father, we all recognize you as our God. And and there are people all around the world serving you and working for you and worshiping you. Um, Today, Lord, we want to be your children too. Uh, We want to have hearts that say yes. Um, I will let you in again today. I will go on your errands. I will be your child your son, your daughter. There's a lot of craziness going on in our world, Father. Uh, People who are in desperate need of help. And and while we can't necessarily change situations around the world, we pray that that you will work to relieve the suffering. And Father, in our own community, in our own family and friends, use us to do the good that you're asking us to do. I can't change the situation in Ukraine. Uh, but I can do something here in this town. Uh, Give us opportunities to make a difference for you. And Lord, as we open your word today, we pray that you will enlighten us with your Holy Spirit and give us joy as we talk about your kingdom. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to think about a topic that you do not enjoy discussing. Maybe it's politics, or badminton, or economics, or that. I'm just coming, giving examples, Joel. Just examples. Think about something that you just have no interest in discussing. Do you have something in your mind? Okay, now t- tell it to the person next to you, or behind you, or in front of you. Uh, what are you not interested in discussing? I just realized the irony of this because I'm encouraging you to discuss something you have no interest in, in discussing. But just raise your hand and and shout out um, what's one thing that you mentioned or your neighbor mentioned that you're not interested in discussing? Philosophy. Philosophy. Okay, good. Politics. What were you going to say, Margo? Politics. Okay. Anybody else? Death. Yeah. Yeah, hard subjects like that. School. All right. You guys are done. Summer break. Uh, And congratulations on your baptism last weekend. We are excited for you guys. What else? Other things you're not interested in discussing? In the back over on this side, just call it out. 
something. Maybe like things in church. Not interested in, in discussing that, right? I was kidding. Okay, yeah. Back to school shopping. Oh, yeah. Let's save that topic for later. Gwen. Sickness. Yeah. You just would rather be done and not have to talk about that at all. Um, there are a lot of things I'm not interested in talking about. Um, if you're a ballerina, that's okay, but I have no interest in, the, in ballet. Zero. I don't want to pay money to go see ballet. I don't want to watch it on TV. Or, but it's okay. I have friends whose uh, family members are ballerinas, and that, that's their job, and God bless them. But I have no interest in that myself. It's a very obvious point here. We tend to talk about the things that we're interested in. Amen? The things that we're passionate about. So at home, I talk a lot about rock climbing. And God bless Sarah. You know, she tries to be interested even if she's not. Because she knows it's something that I'm interested in. And I try to be interested in the things that she's interested in. So here's a question. What was Jesus interested in talking about? If we are Christians, Christians, then we should be following in the footsteps of Jesus. And the things that he loved, those are probably the things that we should love. And the things that Jesus didn't love, those are probably the things that we should not love either. Well, if you read the bulletin, uh, and I heard someone shout it out already. I, I gave it away in my sermon title. I'm going to argue that the kingdom of God was actually Jesus' favorite subject. He talked about a lot of different things. He talked about money. He mentioned money a lot. Uh, but sometimes it was in the context of other themes. He talked about loving and relationships and uh, service and end time events. But I think more than anything, he talked about the kingdom of God. And if Jesus talked about it, we should think about it and read about it and talk about it ourselves. Uh, and we should better understand it. So we're starting a series this morning about the kingdom of God. And I think it's going to be a real blessing. I've been excited and blessed as I've been studying this topic you know, from the very beginning of his ministry, Jesus talked about the kingdom. We'll put a, a slide here up on the screen. You'll see today why I was nervous about the projector not working, but it would have been just fine because a lot of the verses are close together. You would have been great. Matthew 4, 17, from that time on, this is after the baptism of Jesus and after the wilderness temptation. He comes out of the wilderness and... He starts to preach. Jesus began to, to preach, saying, Repent for what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Not too far after that, he said, let's See if the remote worked for us. Oh, okay, we went a little too far. Go back one more. There we go. And Jesus went about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the what? The gospel of the kingdom. What does the word gospel mean? It means good news. He's saying, guys, I have good news for you. The kingdom. And he would talk about the kingdom. Not only that, but he would do healing of all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. The kingdom was so important to Jesus. Notice uh, how he said it here, Luke 4.43. But he said to them, I must preach what? Politics. <laughs> Smudge on my eyes there. I must preach what? Kingdom of God. And by must, that was indicating it was optional for him? He had to. Because he... <laughs> We're going to talk more about this. I'll hold myself back from preaching next week's and the sermons after that. He had to. Kingdom of God had to be preached to the other cities also because for this purpose, he had been sent. It wasn't just something that he liked, like rock climbing. But that's not my purpose in life. <laughs> it's 
not my purpose. His purpose was to preach the kingdom. And if that was his purpose, we should understand what the kingdom is all about. In his first major public sermon, what was it, what was it called? The first major public sermon that he preached. Sermon on the Mount. Look at this. The very first sentence of his first major public address, and here it goes. Blessed are you poor in spirit, for theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. A few verses later in verse 10. What does Jesus say there? He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm not including all the verses from the Sermon on the Mount that talk about the kingdom, but notice this one. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least where? In the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds that righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you by no means will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now there's a lot we're not pausing to unpack today. I want you to be overwhelmed with how... Uh, just embedded in the teachings of Jesus, the concept of the kingdom was. In the Lord's Prayer, how do you pray? Well, let me give you an example of how to pray. He said, our Father, which is in heaven, hallowed be your name, thy kingdom come. He instructed us to pray for the coming of God's kingdom and God's will to be done. What about this one? But seek first. He was talking to people who were worried and stressed out about the basic needs of life. And he said, what you need more than food, water, or clothing, or shelter is the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. We're used to re reciting these verses. We've learned them, some of us, since we were in primary or, or earlier. But he's talking about the kingdom. What is the kingdom? That's what we're talking about in our, this series. Towards the end of his sermon, he wraps it up. He says, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus loved to talk about the kingdom, but not just because it was a subject he enjoyed. It was a subject he knew he had to talk about. It was so important. So when he was teaching, he often talked in stories. We call them, what do we call those stories he used? Parables. He talked in parables. And when you study the parables, you'll see about one-fourth of them are about the kingdom. Notice what he said. He said, the kingdom of heaven, it's like a man who planted good seed in the field. Later on, he said, oh, the kingdom of heaven, it's like, uh, it's like a mustard seed. Or he said, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. That's an interesting one. We're going to talk about the parables of the kingdom uh, at a later day. He talked about it being like treasure that a man hid in a field. Or he said, it's like a pearl that's extremely valuable. That's what the kingdom is like. Or he said, the kingdom is like a net that a guy, a fishing net that he throws out into the ocean to catch fish with. He continued, the kingdom of heaven is like a king that's settling accounts financially with his servants. Or the kingdom of heaven is like a man that's hiring laborers for the day in his vineyard. Laborers at different times of the day. Or it's like a man throwing a wedding party for his son. He's approaching it from all different angles. It's like 10 young ladies that are waiting for a wedding party using symbols and imagery that the people of his day could understand. It's like a man entrusting money to his servants. He's just picking things that were common. Or it's like a man who's planting seeds that would grow. Jesus loved to talk about the kingdom. It was in his sermons. It was in his stories. Uh, it was all over the place. But it wasn't just a subject that he liked. Jesus understood the kingdom as gospel, as good news. And we saw that once already, but I want to show you a couple other verses here. Oh, and there's all 10 or 12 that I put on the screen. And there may be um, one or so that I missed. 
Uh, but I want to show you another verse here. Because for Jesus, the kingdom was essential to the good news. It was gospel. Notice how it says it in Mark 1, 14 through 15. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching what? The gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe what? In the gospel, notice how there's that parallel. He's, he's saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, so repent and believe the gospel. He's kind of equating the gospel and the kingdom. Such good news. Notice this one. This is very interesting. Luke 9. And he called his 12 disciples together, and he gave them power over all demons and to cure all diseases, and he sent them to preach what? So he gets the 12 disciples together. He says, all right, guys, I have a mission for you. You're going to go out into these cities, and you're going to preach, what was it? The kingdom of God, and you're also going to heal the sick. Notice what happens in verse 6 when it's describing what happened and what they preached. So they departed, and they went through the towns preaching what? Well, I thought he told them to preach the kingdom. Are they disobeying Jesus? No, it's because the gospel and the kingdom, they go together. If you don't understand the kingdom, then there is a massive part of the good news that you don't understand. The gospel involves very heavily the kingdom of God. <coughs> So we come to the, um, after the resurrection. Jesus dies. He's raised again. And he wants to meet with his disciples in the time before he's ascending, before he goes up to heaven. And notice what uh, it says that he talked about. He presented himself alive after his suf suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during the 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to what? The kingdom of God. He's been killed. He's been raised back to life again. He only has a little bit of time before he leaves earth physically, bodily, seeing his disciples in person for the very last time, uh, or series of times. And what does he want to talk about? Well, he wants to make sure that they know and understand that he's really alive and can see the Old Testament evidence for it. But on top of that, he wants to talk to him about the kingdom. There's some more things I want to tell you about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. It's the same phrase, by the way. Not two different things. But notice what the disciples say. When they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel. He said to them, the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Repent. Believe the gospel. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's preached for three years. They've been with him every day. They've heard it over and over again. And at the very end, they're like, now, now what was it you said about the kingdom of Israel again? I, remind me. Because that's what I really want to know about. I can imagine Jesus groaning in his spirit as he did at other times. And he just said to them, don't worry about that. It's not for you to know those sorts of things right now. Just wait around and receive the Holy Spirit. How often is it that Jesus is trying to communicate something very clearly to us and we're like, and, what, and what's in it for me, Lord? And, and where's the part where I become magnified and where I get all the, the things, I, the riches I was asking for? or the Where is it where this turns out to make me look really good? You guys don't understand what you're asking for. The kingdom of heaven is what he was concerned with. That was most important, far more important than territories. 
But praise God, the disciples got it. They got it. And as you read through the book of Acts, and we've, been, we've just finished a, a series through most of the book of Acts, look at what they started to preach. Philip, the evangelist, he goes around. When they believed Philip as he preached things concerning what? The kingdom of God. He wasn't even one of the twelve, but he starts preaching the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Both men and women were baptized. What does Paul do? Paul goes around strengthening the souls of disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, saying, we must through many tribulations enter what? The kingdom of God. Paul is preaching the kingdom. Acts 19, and he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for months, reasoning and persuading concerning things of what? The kingdom of God. Paul was reasoning and explaining from the scriptures about the kingdom of God. And then a couple of weeks ago, we, we saw this scene where Paul is about to leave the elders of Ephesus for the very last time. He knows he's going to die. And what does he say to them? He says, indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. He spent a lot of time with the people of Ephesus, and he told them a lot about the kingdom. What about this one? Towards the end of the book of Acts, it says, so when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging. He's in house arrest in Rome, Paul here. And it says, he explained and solemnly testified of what? The kingdom of God, persuading them, things concerning, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. And then our last verse from the book of Acts, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him preaching the kingdom of God and teaching them the things concerning which the Lord Jesus Christ, which concern the Lord Jesus Christ and with all confidence, no one forbidding him. He's in house arrest in Rome. People are visiting him. What does he want to talk about? He wants to talk about the kingdom of God. Praise God. The disciples, the apostles, the evangelists, they figured out The kingdom of God is so important. Have we realized how important it is? Check this out. We love to quote this verse. This is the sign. Right before Jesus returns, what does the Bible say? And this gospel of what? The kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a witness to all the nations. And then what will happen? Then the end will come. Now, there's a lot that's involved in the kingdom of God. We'll talk about that. We're going to be diving into that. But shouldn't this, if any verse, let us know this is an important topic for us to be studying. If this topic needs to be preached, if the kingdom needs to be proclaimed in all the world prior to the return of Jesus, how important is it for us, number one, to understand it, and number two, to proclaim it? It's essential, isn't it? Very important. So the question that we have is, what's the kingdom of God? What's the message of the kingdom of heaven? And how can we proclaim this in and through our lives? Well, you're just going to have to keep coming back. You have to read and study on your own in addition to what I share. Week by week, we're going to get a better understanding together and a better uh, appreciation for Jesus' favorite subject. I'm looking forward to learning more, um, but in addition to that this morning, I want to be a part of God's kingdom. Is that your desire? At the end of the day, and we'll talk about this in a future week, there's only two kingdoms you can be a part of. There's the kingdom of God, and there's the kingdom of Satan. Uh, And we know what it's like to live under Satan's rule with the suffering and death and disaster of this world. I want to be a part of God's kingdom today 
and every day until he returns. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we are looking forward, as it says in the Lord's Prayer, to your, your kingdom coming. We want your kingdom in our lives. Father, we want to better understand what it means to be a part of your kingdom and, and to proclaim the kingdom. So give us that earnest desire. Give us a, a, a passion. And Jesus, we want to love the things that you love. And the things that, that made you sad and upset, Lord, I pray that those things will also be things that, that cause sorrow in our hearts. Basically what I'm saying is we want to have hearts like yours. So help us to live it out day by day. Give us joy as we seek you day after day. This is our prayer. Let all God's children in his kingdom say, Amen.